load considerations. Today's smart home television commercials reveal how little attention is being paid to energy management. Energy management can generate an economic payback faster than solar or batteries on their own while providing useful information for energy site planning. Automated load control means off-grid lifestyle can power more things. A well-sized off-grid system generates an overabundance of energy during the day. Load control, for example, can program a deep freeze to operate only at times of solar excess. Weather data can then be fed into a controller to recognize cloudy days, telling the freezer to then operate only during off-peak times until the sun comes back out. If the freezer lacks enough thermal mass to stay cold while powered off, the problem is easily solved with purchasing two freezers and filling each halfway up with gallon jugs of water. The total load of the building might increase through this strategy, but electricity being used to power the freezers can be turned on only when times uh, that electricity is cheapest. Solar monitoring is improving. For some time, the use of DC optimizers or microinverters has given the solar owner the ability to see the production of every single solar panel on the roof. But even with this overabundance of data, with a solar array on the roof, the homeowner can still be left in the dark with regard to how much energy from their solar array is actually being used by the building and how much of that energy is being sold back to the grid. The other piece to this puzzle is monitoring the electrical consumption of the building itself, knowing the electrical consumption data of the building to an exact degree will only improve any design process of adding solar arrays or batteries to the building. Net metering allows solar projects to be built somewhat blindly, assuming that the production of the solar array and the consumption of the building will even itself out at the end of the billing cycle. But even having monthly electric bills does not reveal the minute by minute level of detail of exactly how energy use in a building fluctuates. Consumption monitoring reveals how much electricity the building is using at any given time, often creating an energy log for later reference. Many companies sell products which install current transducers inside the electric service panel to communicate consumption data to a local or cloud network. Regardless, it becomes clear that residential electrical loads are very spiky, with sporadic peak times where all the loads turn on at once, combined with off-peak times when there is not much electrical load at all. This fluctuation can be problematic. For example, if the utility buyback rate is substantially lower than what the customer is charged for electricity, the end result can be two-thirds of a residential solar array's production, to be discounted 80% when bought back from the utility at the federal minimum. But storing that electricity in a battery isn't necessarily more cost effective because the cost to cycle the battery is within the range of the cost savings between the peak and off-peak uh, charging and discharging times. You know, batteries have other values to residential customers, such as backup power, but it's rare to make a grid-tied residential solar battery more economic. But again, there is the problem that a Tesla Powerwall by itself only outputs 20 amps, but even an energy-efficient air conditioner heat pump unit can momentarily draw 60 amps of power due to internal heating strips for defrosting. A residential service panel, after all, is rated for 200 amps, so even if the Tesla Powerwall were wired to power the entire house, only 10% of the service panel's maximum capacity can be used at any given time. Despite any extra surge capacity of the battery unit itself, the whole house would lose power the minute 
a 60 amp load turned on for more than a minute. While the entire house might only average 10 amps of instantaneous load over the course of the year, the minute to minute loads can surge if all the home loads turn on at the same time. This forces the owner to purchase numerous Tesla power walls if the goal is to back up the entire house, even if only for a couple hours. Imagine only having the budget for a single Tesla Powerwall such that only a critical load panel can be backed up during the blackout. This forces the customer to choose which electrical load should be saved during the power outage, and air conditioning is not on the eligibility list. But I grew up in Houston, Texas. I would give up my lights, the internet, and the food in my fridge before giving up air conditioning in Houston's 10-month-long summer. Wouldn't it be nice to run the air conditioning and then have all of the other devices turn on when the air conditioner was not in use? An increasing number of both solar and battery inverters have relay signals built in which can trigger a relay breaker to turn loads on and off as a function of solar or battery state of charge. For example, a hot water tank could be programmed to only turn on when the building energy load is below 2 kilowatts of power. This forces the hot water tank to only operate during off-peak times. Alternately, the hot water tank could be programmed to turn on only when solar production is above one kilowatt. This forces the hot water tank to be powered by the solar array as it is only on when the solar array is on, thereby reducing electrical outflow issues onto the grid. Battery inverters are expensive. Load control reduces the amount of inverter output capacity required to power multiple devices at the same time. So a home that might be fully backed up with four Tesla power walls instead can get away with two, although the duration for the storage capacity would be half that of the larger system. A fully off-grid house might be run with a 15 kilowatt battery inverter system instead of a 30 kilowatt battery inverter system because of load control. Load controls can increase the longevity and efficiency of a flooded lead acid or even lithium ion battery system. While lithium ion batteries do perform better than lead acid, they aren't perfect. The faster they discharge, the less efficient they get. But even without solar or without batteries, even in a non-emergency setting, energy load controls can result in substantial cost savings for the end user. Any hot water tank can be put on intelligent controls to take advantage of a utility time of use rate structure. This can be triggered via the inverter relay to an automatic switch. This kind of setup is similar to how a whole house automatic transfer switch is triggered to start a generator while switching the home between grid and backup power, except this applies to a single circuit. Circuit level mechanical relays are great to manage a couple of heavy loads, but they can only go so far. Uh, there's no intelligence for optimizing these relays for anything other than basic controls which come with a pre-programmed controller. Such options are not always flexible to reprogram a relay for a particularly nuanced electric rate structure or grid policy. Digital controls would provide a greater customization with less required wiring. With digital controls that you can computer program, uh, preferably they're automated. You know, Non-critical loads of high energy use can become intelligent with digital controls. You know, digital controls can allow energy devices different modes of operation based on site conditions. 
The same controls which throttle a building's electric use when operating off a battery inverter in an off-grid setting can also take advantage of time of use rate structures during normal grid tied operation. In this sense, digital controls allow the home or business owner to optimize their electric use for how they are being billed for their electricity. Commercial customers have the greatest opportunity for savings through load control. Once commercial building energy exceeds 200 amps, the maximum energy use of a standard residential electric service panel, the commercial business is considered a large business and they begin to incur electric demand charges. Demand charges are calculated at the highest 15 minute peak period of peak electric use for the entire month. Even with a modest demand charge of $10 per kilowatt, during that one 15 minute period, the electricity is costing the building owner $2.50 per kilowatt hour for each kilowatt of peak demand. Automatically reducing a commercial facility's energy use during this time period by turning off refrigerators, hot water tanks, and other non-critical devices for a short period of time can generate substantial cost savings with a one to two year simple payback occurring without any subsidy needed. Consider a modest hotel chain, the kind of hotels where each room has an air conditioner built into the wall. Everyone checks into the hotel in a rush, gets to their rooms and cranks that air conditioning or heater, resulting in a huge spike in electric use. Staggering the air conditioner run times would result in the same amount of electricity being used as before, but the peak electrical demand of the hotel is reduced. Turning the air conditioners on and off from the front desk as a function of check-in or check-out status would result in further energy savings. Telling all the air conditioning to turn off for 15 minutes in all but a select few special rooms would result in a cash windfall for the hotelier. An optimal system can save the hotel money without any noticeable difference in comfort to the desk. First is that energy load controls can communicate wirelessly without connecting to the building internet. This reduces wiring and internet security concerns. It is a best practice to put Wi-Fi enabled smart devices on their own Wi-Fi network a feature that high-end internet routers can manage virtually through software rather than literally installing a second Wi-Fi network throughout the building. But some smart home devices are more like installing a physical second Wi-Fi network for device communication. You know, instead of using a Wi-Fi antenna for communication, these smart devices use their own antenna on an alternate frequency. This keeps the smart home device communication physically isolated from the building internet. Uh, the home assistant control hub will benefit from an internet connection, but it is not necessary for home assistant to operate. In my case, I use Z-Wave devices, which uses a similar frequency to old school wireless telephones back before the cell phone era. But other platforms include Zigbee, 433 Hz RF frequencies, high frequency infrared, as well as 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz Wi-Fi. Without getting too far into which frequencies are best for what kind of communication, I'd say that absent a hardwired connection, Wi-Fi devices work best, although they come with their own risks. And for the consumption meter, I use it's Z-Wave, so I went with Z-Wave as my communication protocol. Home Assistant can actually manage multiple protocols at the same time. A consumption meter is installed in the electric service panel. A 40 amp wireless control switch has been installed on an electric tank water heater, or for the hotel mentioned earlier, each in-room air conditioner would have such a switch. Plug-in wall plugs can be installed behind freezers, refrigerators, or even a battery uninterruptible power system that backs up a computer station. 
you know, behind the switch, control boxes, can control ceiling fans. There's a variety of loads that can be automated with Internet of Things devices. In a similar manner to using an Amazon Echo to ask Alexa to turn an Amazon light switch on or off, Home Assistant is programmed to give a wide range of Internet of Things devices a common vocabulary or platform to enable communication between them. Home Assistant is open source. It can be downloaded free and accessed and controlled over a local network, provided that the user has the encrypted username and password generated at the initial programming of Home Assistant. Once the devices are registered with Home Assistant, which is a tedious but not too difficult process, the automation menu allows the user to select which devices to automate based on data that the devices are collecting, as well as additional programming considerations. Here I have the energy devices set up to turn on and off as a function of home energy consumption meters. They could easily be programmed to turn on and off as a function of time of day or excessive solar production or a combination of all these options. So not only is the home energy monitoring the electrical consumption, but it's also using that data to improve the economics of the building electrical system through the load controllers without requiring solar or batteries. Because digital energy controls can be put to an economic use at a lower price point than solar or batteries, with a quicker payback than solar or batteries, uh, with a broader audience uh, than just solar or battery owners, uh, energy monitoring and load controls of a facility should probably be done first before planning a broader energy overhaul of the facility. Home Assistant has a popular chat room on Discord full of voluntary programmers wanting to help you better understand what to do to get started. If you are interested in learning more about home energy automation, I suggest joining that group. With that, we are out of time for this program. I hope you gain some insight into solar design and encourage you to continue with solar for your continuing education. You can find more in-depth material on my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash C slash community solar.